Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CCMTA educational session on moving commercial vehicle drivers towards being recognized as a skilled trade. My name is Lynn Vardy. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Traffic Safety Services at the Ministry of Transportation and Economic Corridors, and I'm also Alberta's representative on the CCMTA Board of Directors. I will be your moderator for our first session, and the session will take approximately one hour. Just a reminder to everyone, we are video videotaping the educational session, and it will be available online shortly after the meeting. The future of Canada's trucking industry depends on a skilled and diverse workforce, and that is why this session is an important one. We have three guest speakers today. Craig Fawcett from Trucking HR Canada will be speaking to us about their approaches to professionalizing the trucking industry. Carol Moon from Women Building Futures who will share what their organization is doing to support and attract a more gender diverse workforce. And finally, Catherine Williams will share with us Alberta's recently announced Class 1 Learning Pathway for Commercial Driver Training. Once we've had all three presentations, we will con conclude with a question and answer period with our guest speakers. So please hold your questions until the end of the session. To start us off, we have Craig Fawcett. Craig is the Chief Program Officer for Trucking HR Canada, a national not-for-profit organization dedicated to addressing the human resources challenges and opportunities in the trucking and logistical sector. Craig leads initiatives to bridge the gap between employers and employees and the need for a skilled, diverse workforce. He works with industry leaders and he works with government to ensure strong, a strong future for the can Canadian trucking industry. Please welcome me, please help me in welcoming Craig to the podium. Good morning, everyone, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here today to have an opportunity to talk about um, some of the initiatives that we have uh, taken on in the last little while uh, that really we hope will have an opportunity to really advance um, recognizing the skills that are required to be a truck driver and potentially down the road to looking at it as a skilled trade as well. Um, I do have, I'm not sure if the slides will be up in a second, but I can just continue forward at this time. Um, so before I kind of get into some of the work that we have done around this, um, as Linda mentioned, we are a national organization and we spend most of our time doing research around HR best practices along with um, uh, providing uh, research around uh, labor market information and also on skills and training. So before I kind of get into why this has become an important issue for us, um, what we've done is that we've done a lot of research recently around some of the labor market forecasts that we're seeing around driver shortages and so on. And this helps drive why we need to look at skills and training as, a, as an initiative moving forward. So recently we released a report in March that looked at labor market projections between now and 2030. And although what we've been hearing recently, especially from employers um, in some of our employer surveys, is that that labor shortage has somewhat softened a little bit as demand for trucking services has softened as well. What we are anticipating is that that need for drivers moving forward will continue to increase and become a, a concern for employers moving forward. So what we anticipate by about 2030 is that our industry will have about 40,000 vacancies at that time. And that's really driven by an increase in employment demand of about 8% over that same period. And what we're going to see too is that uh, unemployment will remain very low, usually about 3 to 3.3%, which means that we're not going to have the, the number of drivers that we need to fill all the vacant positions available. Even if we are able to employ every single unemployed truck driver at that time, we would still only fill about 40 uh, or 40 or 74% of those vacancies, leaving over 10,000 vacancies uh, at that point. And this really, you know, brought, drives the point home for us that uh, looking at skill recognition, looking at how we train drivers is a, an important uh, component 
of what we do moving forward. So what we have done is developed a series of different training resources aimed at uh, driver training, more at the occupational level, which I'll explain in a minute to help, you know, maybe bridge some of those gaps that we see from melt training all the way up to, you know, fully road ready and fully road safe drivers. And we did this through a process of a national working group uh, where we looked at reviewing and updating the National Occupational Standard for Truck Drivers. It was a document that we completed in 2016, and it was about time that we needed to look at that again to make sure that it was still relevant, that we had all of the changes and all the different uh, dynamics in place. Uh, the, the graph I have up, or the slide I have up here is actually all of the members of the working group who helped us with this work. Uh, we wanted to ensure that this work was done nationally that we had represent, uh, representation uh, from coast to coast to coast and we wanted to ensure as well that the resources that we developed and the practices that we identified were industry relevant, industry led and useful to industry as well. So what we determined after we looked at that national occupational standard was that we can really look at truck driver training as essentially in two very broad categories. We'll hear other presentations this morning that will break that down even further from there. But we can look at that drivers are trained obviously at the melt or elt phase. They go through their um, elt or melt related training at a provincial level that usually sets them up to be then able to go on to receive their commercial driver's license uh, through you know road testing from their their, uh, their, jur their jurisdiction. But what we do know is that training doesn't end there. That's really only the beginning of the training that a driver has to do. And drivers continue that training through the next phase, which is what we call that occupational level training phase, which could take anywhere from a couple months to up to two years, depending on the driver. And it's really in this phase that really resembles a almost a, um, as an apprenticeship type model where they are gaining those skills and competence Okay. Not very well, okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't important anyway, don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Am I back? Wonderful. So it's really those skills that are, that are acquired uh, at that occupational level training phase that we wanted to focus on. And this is what a lot of employers or industry would refer to as their finishing program or their onboarding program. And a large number of our employers do take on certain programs like this. Others will have mentoring in place uh, or some type of coaching program that they work with their drivers to make sure that they get from that entry level phase, which they, when they get their CDL, to that um, occupational level phase as well. We also broke out in this model um, specializations that could happen at that time that go beyond just your basic truck drive. And that can include steep mountain passes, it include transportation of dangerous goods, uh, different types of fr specialized freight as well. And those are learned in this phase or beyond the occupation phase. So the importance of this work for us was that it was meant to kind of bridge that gap between entry level training and employment readiness. It also, and really the biggest focus for us was in building employers' ability to offer this occupation. I know. Testing, oh, there we go, wonderful. I'm feeling that Verizon commercial, can you hear me now? Can you hear me yet? I may need to do that a few times today. So, uh, but to kind of continue where I was, was it also provided that foundation uh, for supporting labor mobility, improving safety, and helping potentially co uh, companies uh, work with their insurance to ensure that they are able to provide the training needed to insure new drivers as well. So what we had found is that the industry was already doing a lot of this work, but, and they're doing it their own way. So what we found was that most of the OLT programs out there are delivered through companies themselves. Only about 15% of the employers that we surveyed had a, a partnership with a training school. Otherwise, they're basically building it themselves from scratch. And so those were, but although 40 indicated they'll look at other resources like uh, insurance, consultation, compliance experts, and our, and our own uh, NOS uh, toolkits as well. 
And what we found was that employers want to be able to grow these programs and would like to have more drivers go through them to be able to get through that type of training. So that really decided for us, uh, provided an opportunity to provide some consistency and standardization around that. So we essentially developed about four or five different categories of tools that are now available for drivers. It includes occupational level training programs, which is a review guide for employers who already have something in place, and a development guide for employers who are looking to build something from scratch. We have training guides within there, assessment options, uh, guides for instructors, uh, driver training instructors as well, along with the foundational documents that uh, essentially informed all of the work that we were able to put together. So for us, what this provided was essentially an opportunity to look at driver training at the occupational level in a, a standardized or a consistent way. Um, and it was something that we haven't seen in the industry before because everyone was sort of doing their own thing. So when we look at that, it provides a, an opportunity for the industry to look at potential either accreditation or recognition of skilled trade options moving forward. And so that would be a standardization or a further standardization of both the learned skills and competencies uh, that a driver would need, along with a standardization or a consistency around how you assess for those skills and competencies. And that accreditation would need to look at both curriculum, the training providers, either employers or training schools. It would include uh, the participant of the new driver, along with ensuring there's progress in you know, tracking as we work our way through. It also provides some, um, some I think, some, shed some light on what we can look at for uh, trade recognition as well. So the idea of this model is it provides a support for continuous learning. Uh, what we do need to see within this though is industry support for this. So we've developed these resources. We are now working with industry to build that support from there because what we'll find is that any accreditation or skilled trade costs will have impacts on employers uh, financially. Right now all this training is being done by employers so if we standardize this what is the impacts to employers for that? And also looking to build that support around uh, trade recognition. And where this is helpful within that is that I don't want to go into all of the, uh, the weeds on what, what is required to have a, a, an occupation uh, recognized as a skilled trade, but one of the main components is the consistency of trading, the consistency of that trade's use over many jurisdictions or within the industry. Having an occupational level training center helps aid us in understanding what that could be and where we may need to go with that. And potentially as well, it has some implications for Red Seal trade uh, as we can maybe look to recognize this in five different jurisdictions, which would give us that, uh, that designation along with other steps that need to go through. But at least those are some of the main hurdles we would look at. So our work is to continue to uh, promote uh, the resources that we've developed, uh, helping to look at how we can standardize uh, occupational level dr uh, driver training uh, or make it more consistent across the board and ensuring that we are raising the level of that training with employers. And that's really looking to recognize some of those best practices and, and ensuring that we keep our resources relevant. So thank you and I'll turn it back over to Lynn. Thank you, Craig. Very informative presentation. I would, I would now like to welcome Carol Moan to the podium. Carol is the president and CEO of Women Building Futures, um, which is an established nonprofit championing economic security for women. A professional engineer with over 35 years of experience, Carol brings a strong leadership, governance, and strategy background. She volunteers as a director of the Excel Society and the Covenant Foundation, chairing their governance committees. Carol was recently awarded the prestigious Queen Elizabeth II Platinum Jubilee Medal for her contributions to Alberta. Welcome, Carol. Awesome, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today alongside both Craig and Catherine, um, speaking to some of the change that's needed across the transportation industry in order to help us address some of those very intimidating, intimidating resource projections that are in front of us. 
WBF is a nonprofit on a mission to support economic security for women. And we do that through capability and confidence building, followed by resilient careers. And for us, that's predominantly careers in the trades and the transportation industries. And those resilient careers, ultimately, and sustainable careers are what ultimately offer that economic security. Uh oh. There we go. Our, uh, our work gets women ready for industry, uh, but now our work also is, is getting industry ready for women, which is ultimately somewhat at the core of the presentation today. The industries that we, uh, that we partner with would be full of women if there weren't some form of barriers in between women and those careers. Over the last 25 years, nearly 3,000 women have graduated from WBF's programs. As a result, we've become acutely aware of the number of barriers that unemployed and underemployed women simply face by trying to get ahead. Things like lack of simple awareness that these careers are really even a good fit for, for women, for themselves, financial supports to navigate those training periods, access to affordable and, ch and quality childcare, family supports, educational barriers, access to personal transportation, and much more. The, uh, the WBF support services and programs have all been developed with all of these things top of mind to help ensure that women enter, when women enter our, our programs, they succeed. And then they need to succeed in sustainable employment. And significant barriers remain relative to this as well. Inclusive workplaces are a focus for us, and we manage our employer of choice programs in order to help navigate that. When women succeed, they ultimately gain pride in themselves and strength and confidence to also lead their children on great paths. When a woman is connected to economic security, their children are too, and often for their lifetime. It's been proven that the work that we're doing is, in fact, multi-generational. So why shouldn't women, your wives, your daughters, your sisters, be equitably represented in the economy and the workplaces that we know they can all be incredibly capable in? It's just right, as well, there's years and years of hard data relative to the very positive bottom line impact of diversifying workforces. Sorry, jumped one too many there. Craig has touched on some data, and, uh, and I will briefly through this presentation as well, but clearly women are an untapped resource uh, relating to the workforce gaps that are across many industries, in this case, including the transportation industry. So why not work hard to take action before we actually hit that really critical uh, stage? And that's ultimately what we're trying to do with all of our partners. There are tangible benefits that we always hear about from leaders, our partners, that have been embracing bringing women into underrepresented roles for years. They bring unique and valuable experiences to their work. They're compassionate and carry a level of emotional intelligence that helps them make teams better. They want their team members to excel. They listen, they absorb instructions on what's expected of them, and they finish tasks well. They consistently take good care of equipment and their workplace. They collaborate with optimism. Having women on workplaces and on work sites within organizations ultimately makes those organizations better. These are all of our programs. The ones at the top and the bottom we call our wraparound supports, and it all starts with ensuring readiness. And when ready, women have access to many different training programs based on their interests. The ones on the middle left are considered our core programs, and the programs on the middle right are examples of those that we've developed in direct partnership with employers. We ultimately stay connected with our alumni. We're here if they need us for coaching or any kind of supports as they navigate their careers and continue to fill their toolboxes. Women are incredibly underrepresented in the workforces that we're connecting them to. And having those supports available for them whenever they need them is ultimately what helps keep them in that industry. Our partnership model is really quite remarkable, and I actually believe the secret behind our success. 
We bring together government and the private sector to solve the unemployment and the underemployment of women and at the very same time help diversify workforces, which of course has a massive bottom line social and business impact. The government of Alberta has been a tremendous partner to WBF and those that we serve and we're working hard to build similar relationships in other provinces as we grow our impact as well. I think our private sector partners are the ones perhaps I am the most proud of. When WBF started 25 years ago, I understand we had to convince companies to hire women from our programs. Companies are now equally as committed to the social side of the work that we do as they are to getting help to close the critical resource gaps that are in front of them. And we really are truly partners in our mission together. Over time, as our mission has become better understood, the support for hiring from our programs increased and WBF could actually be a little bit more deliberate about who we partnered with. We're moving towards a model where companies won't hire from our programs unless they're employers of choice. We're also defining a similar approach with our training partners as well. The EOC and TOC programs represent employers and eventually trainers who are truly committed to diversity, equity, inclusion and safety in their workplaces at all levels. Providing great places to work provides economic security through careers that women actually want to stay in, which obviously is at the centre of, of our mission and our work. WBF's mission is reliant on partnerships and ultimately incredibly reliant on critical funding. As such, it's really important for us to measure the impact our work, our work is having and to be able to tell our story. So in our recent annual year, we assisted women with readiness supports 533 times. This could be building mass skills to financial planning. In that same year, 48 women that had previously received readiness supports entered one of our 18 life-changing programs that were offered. 94% of the women entering a program graduated, or 188 women. Of those, 38% were previously unemployed and the lion's share underemployed, an example of which is a woman working multiple jobs to get by. 35% had dependents, many single moms, and 21% of our graduates were Indigenous women. 87% of all of our grads were employed in an industry directly related to their training within six months of graduation, making a starting wage on average of 1.3 times a living wage. We uh, have significant operations in Alberta and as I mentioned, through encouragement of our partners are also moving some operations into Saskatchewan and Ontario. So we're excited to continue telling that story. Okay, so now let's jump to WBF and transportation. Transportation forms a cornerstone to all of us and our ability to enjoy our lives the way we do today. Resources in the industry are aging and not enough people that move into the industry are staying. In Alberta between 2018 and 2022, the biggest age demographic that suffered losses was 25 to 34. And that is absolutely a concerning st statistic. Sorry. And of course, we're not shocked by the representation data here either. And this is specific to Alberta. Over this same period, nearly uh, women represented only 3% of the class one drivers and 9% of the class three drivers. So obviously, again, women are an incredibly untapped resource for this industry. Boy, this is a happy trigger. Sorry about this. Um, so why aren't they there? Why aren't women in the industry? WBF's work for 25 years has been fundamentally removing barriers in between women and resilient careers in industries where women are underrepresented. We've learned a lot through that 25 years of work and we're confident that we also understand many of the barriers that are in between women and the transportation industry as well. And the barriers aren't few and many of the barriers actually are not small either. Recognizing the career as one that women want and one that wants them. Making it a career that women can be proud of, work hard in, one they can develop in. Ultimately, the conversations around the trade path and the, and the red seal trade uh, fits really, really nicely in here. A culture that welcomes women and all diverse people. And all of us need to stop accept, uh, um, accepting that that's just how the industry is. Those are the sorts of changes that we need and want to make and what we're trying to do with our work. 
Accepting that these are barriers and then addressing them is important. And if not, even if we can run programs to try and bring women into this industry, they simply won't stay. They need to want to stay. WBF has offered our, uh, operated our Class 3 driver operator program successfully for many years. And in 2016, we built an additional partnership for Class 1 with companies that were all willing to do the work to make their workplace one where women would want to stay. Our results were fundamentally strong, but not without some challenges. Between 2017 and 2021, 69 women graduated from our programs. 92% of those students graduated and cleared their class one license. And through this time, we built a great transportation alumni network that we support and continue to leverage off of today. I mentioned challenges. Obviously, the implementation of MELT was a challenge for everyone, and I know the industry and the government is working really hard to learn from that and ultimately optimize. WBF also sometimes experienced challenges getting qualified women into our programs, issues with driver's licenses, past driver's licenses, complications that they'd had in their earlier lives. There were ongoing challenges with scheduling of testing at the driver schools, which caused significant delays. But the most concerning challenge that we had was the experience that some of our students were having while in the driving schools. Significant cultural challenges and the result, resulting poor experience of too many students resulted in women leaving our programs less confident than when they came in. So those experiences caused some students to question their place, not only in our program, but in the industry, and they made decisions to not proceed. WBF then paused our class one programming with the desire to restart and ultimately continue to nurture our relationships with our incredible partners that truly wanted to help raise the bar across the industry. We also advocated hard that systemic cultural change was required across the industry to be able to attract not only women, but youth. And the government of Alberta was very interested in what we had to say. So we received support for some really important work over two years. We're deploying our employer of choice assessment and supports across many companies in the industry seeking their commitment to an inclusive workplace. We're actively marketing the industry, the opportunity, our connection to employers of choice, and our commitment to an inclusive and positive training experience. That positive training experience will result from ultimately our new partnerships with identified schools initially in Calgary and also Edmonton. They're actively working with us on some change, and WBF is supporting that with policy and training. We want them to be great so that our student experience while in their schools is great, and they're on board for that, and we're excited about it. We're also at the table with government and others from the industry working hard to collaborate broadly on, overall, on the overall commercial driver shortage, and we're thrilled with the interest from women in our new relaunched Class 1 programs. We supported 12 women in Year 1 and are on target to support 36 women in Year 2, all achieving Class 1 licensing and employment with good companies. In wrap up, we've talked a lot about WBF's thoughts on um, what needs to change to help women see themselves in the transportation industry. A more inclusive culture across the industry is needed to attract and retain people. WBF is doing that through our work and ultimately through our partnerships, but the industry is much bigger than us in our partnerships. We work with our alumni um, as long as they want, and so when they have challenges at work or in their development, we can help them, which ideally helps keep them in the industry as well. This works and ultimately should be a consideration by all employers to help retain underrepresented individuals in their workforce. So thank you for listening to our story. Please, uh, please share it with your networks. Connect women with us that need some support to move forward confidently in a, in a career where they're underrepresented. Uh, I also ask that you embrace the concept that barriers are real. There are barriers in front of diverse people and your industry, and ultimately we all need to work together to try and help remove them. And consider becoming a WBF transportation employer of choice. And most importantly, work really hard every day at getting the industry more ready for women and other diverse people. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Carol. Very informative, and I'm delighted to see the numbers of uh, interested women in the uh, Class 1 training program in Alberta. We will now hear from our last speaker for this session. Um, Catherine Williams is the Director of Strategic Initiatives within Alberta Transportation and Economic Corridors, and she is leading the Class 1 Learning Pathway Initiative in Alberta. Prior to joining Transportation and Economic Corridors, uh, Catherine worked with the Ministry of Justice and Solicitor General. She brings a very strong background in policy and stakeholder engagement, and we're delighted to have her here today to share with you the learning, Class 1 learning pathway that Alberta will be moving forward with. So without further ado, over to Catherine. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, having uh, been able to witness Craig and Carol's great presentations, I realize mine looks very government-y right now, so sorry about that. Um, but what I lack in graphic design, I hope to make up to you with sheer enthusiasm for the subject, which is the changes to Alberta's Class 1 licensing and driver training, and also talk a little bit about our approach towards getting a trade designation for commercial vehicle drivers in our province. All right, so maybe I didn't need to include this slide, but I thought I would just do a quick context setting for anyone that may not be familiar with what mandatory entry-level training is, or MELT for short. Really quickly, this is uh, pre-licensing training that is required for anyone that wants to get their Class 1 license. Um, this is a requirement in Alberta currently and across most of the country. Uh, this conversation really began in 2016 on a national scale. Alberta rolled it out in 2019, and currently our program is six to eight weeks for, a train, for someone to complete before they get their Class 1 license, and we have capped the fee at $10,000 for driver training schools to provide this training. Uh, so that's the current context in Alberta. Since we rolled out the program, it's been almost five years now, we've had some feedback from stakeholders suggesting that it's really hard for some new prospective drivers to be able to afford the $10,000 fee. We've heard from, from driver training schools that the $10,000 fee is a little too low for them to provide quality training. We have heard that it's difficult for MELT grads to actually get employment after they graduate because it's really hard for them to get insurance and the insurance rates are too high. And we've also heard that the training is a little bit of a barrier in some cases and is exacerbating the commercial driver shortage, which we heard from both speakers is, is a real issue facing Alberta and the country. Uh, so we took these concerns quite seriously. We did a deep dive and we hired an independent consultant in the fall to go away and take a look at the program and come back with some recommendations for us. And they sure did do a deep dive. They talked to our examiners, our driver training schools, our carriers. Um, they did some data analysis. They did cross-jurisdictional scans. And they came back with a ginormous 300-page report that ultimately said, you know, no surprise, Pre-licensing training is really great for Class 1 drivers. There are some recommendations you guys could be making to your program to make it a little bit more accessible and deal with some of the issues that we've been seeing and hearing from some of the folks out there. Um, so those recommendations are, the key ones anyway that we're gonna talk about today, are implementing tiered or restricted Class 1 licenses in very limited circumstances, allowing for online or virtual delivery options, which we haven't been doing a lot of in Alberta, and they recommended we do more of that. Um, Increase the quality of uh, competency training that is being provided to trainers and increase the in-cab hours so that learners really have a lot of opportunity to do hands-on training uh, before they get to their Class 1 license road test. At the same time this MELT review was conducted, we also stood up a commercial driver shortage committee, which I know Carol talked about as well. She's a proud member, happy to have Women Building Futures on there, as well as Craig. Um, and we have a real uh, grab bag of folks across the industry that have a really good understanding of the commercial driving space. So we have cross-government ministries, we have um, industry players, and we also have insurance representation as well. And everyone brings a very nuanced perspective to the issue. We have lots of really interesting discussions of the committee. Um, we don't always agree on everything, but we do agree on four pillars that we are using to sort of theme out the commercial driver shortage as we understand it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each pillar next. So the four pillars of the commercial driver shortage are, um, 
I'll actually be a little bit naughty and start in the middle of the slide here with financial viability. So we know that there's been a dramatic increase in the size of liability claims for trucks operating outside of Canada. And this is often what we hear from insurance is trucks going into the States and are being exposed to something called nuclear jury verdicts. Uh, so huge settlements that are being passed along to the rest of the industry in terms of premiums. Um, to add to this, commercial carriers are just like us. They're feeling the effects of inflation and extreme weather events have also had a negative impact on their operations. So when we think about commercial carriers, sometimes we think of these huge multi-million dollar companies that you, know, you can afford a little bit here and there of inflation and extra pressures. But the fact of the matter is, in Alberta, 73% of our commercial carriers have an average fleet size of five or less trucks. 36% of our carriers have one truck. So these folks really do feel these kinds of uh, price increases. Which takes us to the second point, training and transferability. And this is really what we're seeing when melt grads are finishing their melt training, come out and say, okay, like time to get some insurance, time to get down to work. And insurance agencies will often say to these folks, we need three years of driving experience before we can give you affordable insurance. So this is very difficult. They find themselves in a, a tough situation, hard to get employed, especially by some of the smaller carriers. And also to Craig's point, there's some finishing training that's often required as well for MELT graduates. So that's another thing, that's another item that carriers can't always afford, if, especially for the smaller folks. There's also a retention issue in the industry. I find it really interesting that 31% of all class one license holders are actually employed as commercial truck drivers. So there's a huge majority of folks out there that are not working in the profession. So it could, we've heard from industry, we could do a better job screening at the outset of MELT training uh, they said to me before, you know, everyone can drive, not everyone should drive, so you should do a better job filtering at the beginning. Uh, so that's something that we've taken to heart. We also know that the average commercial driver wages have not increased as quickly as some of the comparable jobs out there. So folks are going for the higher paid salaries. And last, but certainly not least, there is an attraction issue right now as well. Craig and Carol talked about that themselves. Uh, commercial driving is not viewed particularly favorably by women um, and by youth under the age of 25 right now. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the sedentary, sedentary nature of the work uh, that's dangerous sometimes. Uh, sometimes it requires a lot of hours away from home. And, and the fact of the matter is it takes a lot of skill, long-term planning, and specialized knowledge to be a very good, safe, commercial vehicle driver, and yet this occupation is currently classified as semi-skilled. Uh, really, this is interesting because the profession is the lifeblood of our economy and it is not designated as a trade. In fact, it's actually competing with trade designations and apprenticeship style programs that are feeding learners right from training into meaningful work opportunities. So they're finding themselves a little bit on their back heel in this situation. All right, which leads us to my favorite part, the class one learning pathway. So this was informed by our MELT review. It was informed by our conversations with the Commercial Driver Shortage Committee, as well as other policy options. And I'll just say that the first three phases, uh, pardon me, cabinet approved this, and uh, this was approved in February of this year. And the first three phases will be implemented by 2025 this spring. So we're working really hard on getting that set up now. And phase four and phase five are future state phases, um, but they are optional as well. Um, but work is already underway on those as well. And I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on that in the next slide. But let's start with phase one, which is the explorer phase. So there's two purposes behind this phase. Number one, the explorer phase is to be a little bit of a filter. So more uh, of a um, showing folks what it's like to have a day in the life of a commercial driver, um, what it's like to work in the industry, giving them a little bit more of that knowledge before they start taking the MELT training. And if they do, making sure the MELT training is available for them online. So we have pre-licensing training. It's not just a cut and paste of current MELT curriculum, what's currently conceived as being in the classroom, but really taking a thoughtful approach and what these learners need to know before they get to a driver training school and have that foundational knowledge already with them. So moving on to phase two, which is the apprenticeship phase. This is about in-cab, in-yard, hands-on, learner-focused training. And this would be taking place at a lot of driver training schools across the province. Um, after around 50 hours of intensive training, a uh, learner would be able to challenge the class one knowledge and road test. Uh, and if they passed, they would get a restricted apprenticeship style license, which would allow them to get hired by a carrier, but would remain in the province during this phase. 
Moving on to phase three, this could be a streamlined approach or the learner might need a little bit more time in phase two, but when they're ready to move on to phase three, this is about having a competency assessment. So taking a really good look at where a learner is strong, maybe they're very good at backing up a trailer, maybe they need a little bit of work in cargo securement. So really spending some extra time bearing down on focusing on what that learner needs to know before those restrictions are taken off their license so we have a good safe driver at the end of it. Phase four is about getting advanced training. So this is optional. A learner does not have to do this, but this is about someone that wants more training, more micro-credentialing, specialized training for folks that are really invested in their careers and want to be good drivers and have higher pay. So that's what phase four is all about. And this is leading us to the jewel of the, of the pathway, which is the Red Seal certification. So we're really hoping to get a Red Seal certification for these folks, which is basically a cross-jurisdictional standard and recognition of high competency and high skill in someone's profession. And because this is cross-jurisdictional, we need four other provinces to designate commercial driving as a trade and to come with us on the Red Seal certification journey. And that way we'll be able to actually get this done. We've been hearing from industry, this is something they've wanted for over 10 years. And this is something we're really in earnest working on right now. Which brings me to my last slide. This is the industry training and designated trade slide. So work is underway on this right now by our sister ministry, Advanced Education, because this part is really their bailiwick. They are right now having a 15-person working group, industry-led, who have put together a really great proposal on getting a designated trade and industry training program. It is being finalized right now, and then it will be passed up through the various levels of review and advanced education, all the way up to the minister, who I understand is really on board with this. So we're really looking forward to seeing how this work proceeds. And because this is supporting phase four and phase five of the pathway, transportation is taking, taking uh, sorry, uh, care of the first three phases. We're working in lockstep together to make sure that this is a seamless transfer of uh, if a learner going from one phase to another. So we're going to all each other's meetings, we're going to all each other's workshops. We really want this to be uh, a great program and uh, they actually developed this slide for me as well. So we're, we're that close right now. So I just will close my presentation down now by letting you know that if any of this interests you, Caitlin, my amazing teammate and I, in the Oilers jersey at the back, have booth 12 at the Exhibitor Hall if you want to come and chat with us about, any, about anything that was in this presentation or anything at all, please come by and visit us. Uh, we'd be glad to talk to you, especially about the trade designation piece, which we really think will attract new learners to the industry, retain learners, and really invest in safety in those that want to stay in the profession and be good, strong learners and good drivers on the road. Thank you very much.